Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Tom and Greek Wire for giving me an opportunity to come in front of you and, and talk about a question that I believe uh, many of you may have faced uh, in your company or are facing in your company or organization when you think about infrastructure, which is uh, how do we use public cloud? Do we use public cloud, private cloud, or what is our strategy? In the next 20, 25 minutes, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of preview of how we at Dropbox approach answering this question for ourselves and some lessons that we learned along the way that I'm hoping that will be valuable for you guys as well. Before I get into that, uh, a little bit about Dropbox. Uh, hopefully, a lot of you are familiar with it. Uh, in 2007, Drew and Arash, our co-founders, built this product called Dropbox to solve a problem that all of us were starting to face. That was the year iPhones came out. I know it's hard to imagine a world without smartphones, but in 2006, none of, them, none of us had that device in our hands that we have today. And the problem was that people wanted to be able to access and share and work on the content anywhere, everywhere, and on any device. And when they built this product, People started using it. They started using it for their personal use cases. People were storing their photos, their memories, their videos. But more importantly, they brought that product to their work. What we saw in the early days of Dropbox was people brought the product they loved in their personal life to their work, to their organizations, and started using our product to collaborate with their teams, uh, with their colleagues, and with their organizations. And in 2011, we built a product called Dropbox for Teams specifically geared towards that use case, where people would, could use Dropbox to share content, to organize content, and collaborate on the content with their colleagues, both within the company and outside the company. And since then, we have become one of the largest collaboration platforms in the world, where there are thousands of companies, big ones, small ones, uh, using Dropbox on a daily basis to get their work done. This includes companies like National Geographic, where writers and photographers all over the world, even in some of the most remote locations uh, in the world that you can imagine, use Dropbox to share their articles, share their photographs, and collaborate to create the next edition of the magazine that we all love seeing on our newsstands and most probably on nowadays online. And with 500 million users and th more than 300,000 Dropbox for business customers, you can imagine as the company grew, we also had to grow our infrastructure. We are one of the largest cloud so cloud service providers with a massive global infrastructure that supports more than one exabyte of user content that is shared, collaborated, synced to your devices with more than a billion files synced every day. That is a huge amount of infrastructure that goes into supporting that. And obviously, it did not happen in a single day. As any company, and we are a 10-year-old company now, but when we were a startup, as the company grew, we had to grow our infrastructure. We had to build new strategies and we were also growing under this umbrella of the public cloud. Again, if you go back in 2007, AWS had, I think, maybe one or two services. It was S3 and SQS. And as we were growing, we were seeing this emerging trend of public cloud. And we had to figure out what we want to do uh, with our infrastructure as our user base and our customers were growing. So take you down the memory lane a little bit. Uh, in early 2011, just around the time I joined Dropbox, uh, we were actually using a term that's become much more common nowadays, but back then I don't, I'd at least never heard it being used, which was a hybrid infrastructure. We used to use public cloud to store the files of our users, but then uh, we used managed hosting services to host our databases and compute. As we grew, we migrated our databases and compute uh, to our own data centers, which we managed and operated and built. Three years later, in 2015, we actually moved bulk of our data from public cloud to our own in-house custom-built exabyte storage system called Magic Pocket. It was a defining moment for the company and also something that uh, a lot of people in this industry took notice of because this was a time when a lot of companies were actually moving from their private cloud to the public cloud, whereas we chose to move some of our biggest piece of infrastructure from public cloud to private cloud. And I'll go into some of the details about why did we make that decision, because it was a very valid question that a lot of people asked us. Why are you doing that? The entire industry seems to be moving the other trend, uh, and whereas we actually did something in the opposite. But since then, 70% uh, of our users are outside of US, and in our commitment to make sure that every user, no matter where they are, continues to use 
Dropbox and experiences the same reliability and performance, we expanded our footprint, our infrastructure globally by building a global backbone as well as POPs to make sure that every user gets the same performance and continues to uh, deliver value to our end users. Since then, we have continued the journey of innovation that we have uh, been extremely proud of. We were, one of the we were one of the first companies to adopt SMR. It's a brand new technology in hard drive that allows you to store more data on a single platter. And we were one of the first companies to deploy it at the scale at which we operate. We were also the first company, sorry, we were also the first company uh, to use, um, to deploy the AMD's new compute chip, Epic. You may have heard about it. When they entered this, re-entered this market actually, because they were in this market about 15 years back, we were one of the first companies which we worked closely with them to deploy that. And more recently, we also announced the ability to our customers to be able to store their data locally for customers who are in Asia Pacific and Japan, something they, they really care about from a data locality and regulated point of view. And we were able to give that functionality to them as we globally expanded our infrastructure. So as we were doing this, um, expanding our infrastructure, uh, building out, meeting the user, go, uh, user needs, as you can imagine, it's pretty chaotic. Uh, Dropbox still is a pretty small company. We're about 2,000 people. It was really important for us to be able to figure out how do we think of building infrastructure. As I said, this is around the same time the public cloud was gaining more traction. If you actually go to Google and search for old news articles, you will see articles ranging from all over the place where uh, the, the world was dismissive of this public cloud, where people thought that no self-respecting enterprise company will ever use public cloud because it's not secure, because it's not reliable, to what you see now, where it's become actually the default. And people actually ask you more often, why are you not using public cloud, as opposed to why are you using public cloud? And we had to do it, uh, we had to make decisions about whether to be on the public cloud or not to be on the public cloud. And one of the first things that we did uh, was to realize that the answer may not be one or another. And we came up with what I call the three question test. Uh, it's a very simple test that we apply to every stack of our infrastructure, not just the whole thing, but every system, every workload that we want to solve. We apply this question test to answer whether we should be using public cloud or private cloud. And I wanted to share those questions with you. The first question that we ask ourselves, whenever we're thinking of any system or infrastructure that we need to serve our users, is that do we have the scale to be cost effective. If anyone in the audience has managed or run infrastructure, I'm sure you, you know this, that one of the ways you get cost effective is scale. The bigger you are, the more cost effective, the more optimizations can you can drive in infrastructure. So if you're running a single machine and that's your infrastructure, chances are that you don't have too many levers to be able to optimize that cost. However, if you're at the scale of Dropbox, which is typically called the web scale, there are a lot of levers that you can pull to optimize your infrastructure from a cost point of view. But the key thing, uh, and when I talk to a lot of companies, is cost cannot be the only driver for you to decide whether it's public or private. There are other factors that have to go into it, which is where the second and the third question come in. The second question that we ask ourselves is, assuming you have scale, and in Dropbox scale, most of the time we do have scale, is do you believe that you have the ability to innovate, to leverage that scale and innovate in building custom services or a differentiated capability in your infrastructure that the public cloud may or may not provide. And this is very important. Uh, again, when I talk to uh, people who talk to us about our story, I tell them to be really, really honest with yourself and answer yourself whether you have the capability. This includes taking into account whether you have the capability of hiring the right talent. Running infrastructure at scale is a hard, hard job. And you should convince yourself that you have the ability to hire the right talent. Are your workloads different enough that you need capabilities that you cannot buy off the shelf from a public cloud? And the last is whether you are committed as a company, as an organization, to go on this possibly a multi-year journey to drive that innovation. Innovation, building infrastructure, takes years. It doesn't take months. It's not a week project. It's, not a, it's, it's a multi-year commitment. And you have to make sure that your company is ready to make that commitment, whether because you know, your leadership needs to believe in, in it, or you may not have the resources to do that. The third question, even if you have that capability, even if you have the scale, and you have the capability, you have the talent, you're able to commit multi-energy, 
The last question, which is extremely important for us, is to convince ourselves that that innovation has a direct value to our users. Dropbox is an extremely user-centric com company, and every single thing, everything we do, we make it a point to ask ourselves, what we're doing, does it really matter to the end user? If the answer is no, then you have to ask yourself, why do you want to innovate? Is it really important for you to innovate, or would you rather use something like a public cloud to use that? And we have been applying this, this three question test uh, for the last five or six years on every big or small decision that we make because what we have found is uh, once you start understanding the principles that go behind making a decision, you're able to make a more nuanced decision as opposed to uh, having a unilateral decision like, oh, we will be all public or all private. And as a result, our infrastructure actually is a, is a very unique blend of private and public cloud. There are aspects of our infrastructure where we have uh, invested heavily uh, to build our own private cloud capabilities, and there are things that we have gone all in with public. And I'll use two examples to motivate how the three question test was applied um, uh, to make that decision. The first one was storage. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, in 2015, uh, we did what was the industry-defining movement of doing the largest data migration from public cloud to private cloud around storage. And when we applied the test, we had the scale. I just shared with you that we store more than an exabyte of data in our infrastructure. A very few companies in the world, a handful of them actually, can actually claim to have that much data. We had the talent. Dropbox is known uh, to have extreme small, uh, smart engineers. And more importantly, we knew that our workload, the way people are using Dropbox with their content, is differentiated enough, it's unique enough that we can customize our hardware, our software, to provide innovation. Uh, we were the first company to use SMR, uh, a brand new technology in hard drive, something that you would not be able to lean on if you were not on private cloud. And the last thing, uh, which was about the value of users, when we talked to the users, they were very interested in reliability, they were interested in performance, and we knew that if we innovate and we keep ourselves the bleeding edge of the technology, we can build custom storage solutions that will also have a huge business impact. And as a result, we moved storage in-house. But at the same time, we knew that building data centers, building network, buying hardware takes time. So we retained the capacity, the capability to be able to use public cloud for storage whenever we need it. So we actually, this was one of the first systems that was built in a hybrid fashion where we seamlessly can move a user's data between public cloud and private cloud, depending on what they want, depending on what the business wants, depending on what product wants. But investing heavily into our own in-house storage system was uh, one of the fundamental things that we did and has proven successful from both our business as well as users. On the other side, analytics is a use case that we have gone all into the public cloud. So let's apply the three question test again. Do we have the scale on analytics? The answer was yes. We have tens of petabytes of analytics data that keeps on growing day by day as our users continue our product. We use that data to understand our user behavior. We use that data to understand how we can, what features are working well, what features are not working well. It's a massive amount of data. So we could have chosen to invest in-house. But that's where the second question comes in, which is, do we believe that we can build differentiated experiences around analytics that a, a cloud provider or a public cloud can provide? And the answer was, we can't. Like what? What can we do which is so different from any other company's public, uh, any other co company's analytics needs? We would want the same kind of uh, experiences, same kind of capability of doing queries. So it was not clear, even if we had the capability, what would we do differently? And more importantly, when we applied the third question, let's assume a world that we had some magical in-house analytics business intelligence engine, which was superior than public cloud. Does it really add meaningful value to the users? The end users are not really buying our product because we are best in analytics. They're buying our product because we provide a cloud service that is reliable, that's performant, that allows them to do their work done. So in this case, although we did have the scale, although we could say that we would be much more cost efficient if we had done things in-house, we have chosen to go public cloud because that's what makes sense. And by applying these things again and again, we have found that we are able to get best of the world, where the strengths public cloud has, 
uh, where it's easier to go to market, it's faster to deploy, it's easy to scale. At the same time, there are advantages in private cloud where we're able to innovate and build customized capabilities infrastructure that our engineering teams are able to use to deliver value to the user. Obviously, this was not uh, as simple as us writing down three questions and it all worked out. Uh, it was a 10-year journey and we made a lot of mistakes. We learned a lot and I wanted to share also a few lessons that we learned along the way. One of the first lessons that we learned, uh, and this was a little bit early in the game, was the importance of establishing and communicating your strategy on infrastructure to the entire organization. So when I joined Dropbox uh, from Google, um, we made some decisions, but I failed to, to communicate and articulate why we are making certain decisions a certain way. And it took us some time to realize that unless you are able to very concisely, very simply say, this is why we are doing certain things. This is why we're using the public cloud. This is why we're building our private cloud. And more importantly, why? You will not get the necessary buy-in from the organization. And that really impedes your ability to execute fast. If people don't understand why you're using X and not Y, they will find ways where they will not be able to move forward with you. So it is really important to be able to step back, understand your strategy, understand what works for you. But then spend the hours, spend the time talking to the organizations, talking to the people who are going to be doing the work, and explaining why that makes sense for the company and for the business you are in. The second lesson we learned uh, as we started moving into this hybrid infrastructure strategy is, is the importance of automation. One of the biggest benefits of public cloud is that it takes away a lot of operational complexity. You don't have to manage your network, you don't have to manage your hardware, you don't have to build our data centers, and there's a lot of operational complexity that comes with it, which public cloud takes away. But when you're building a private cloud, you have to deal with that. And we understood that as we were scaling to becoming one of the largest collaboration platforms, we had to lean on automation to remove those complexity and automate as much as operational work humans were doing uh, to be done by machines. So very uh, around 2015, when we were trying to move things into in-house, we invested a lot to be able to build a system where we assume machines fail every hour. And when they fail, no human has to do anything. The machine gets out of the, uh, out of the loop, services move, and things keep running. And that was very important for us to scale. It's also important because that operational complexity is often the hidden cost of private cloud. But if you automate well, your private cloud will be as efficient as the public cloud. The last Lesson that we learned, again, as we were scaling up, and remember we were running um, hybrid infrastructure, uh, was around uh, the importance of bringing the same discipline and rigor that you often see when you're running on private cloud into actually managing your public cloud. So if you think about it, if any of you uh, use public cloud or work on teams that manage public cloud, the beauty of public cloud is it's so easy to Scale up. You want 1,000 instances for your infrastructure? Press a button, you have it. You want to put more data? You have it. Uh, whereas on the private cloud, it's a little bit more complicated. Oh, you wanted 1,000 more servers? You should have told us three months back because we have to order those machines. They will come in. Some is going to put them up, turn them on, put operating systems. So often you see companies which are running private cloud have built the processes, have built the muscle to be very disciplined about things like capacity planning, things about understanding what the product needs, having a lead time before product needs X to be able to take the time to build it. That need does disappear when you're using public cloud, and that's good. If particularly for a small company trying to make it big, that's actually good because you don't want to deal with that. You don't even know what the, the, your needs will be in six months. However, as we were scaling up, as we became more established, as we got into the web scale, the thing that we started seeing and again, something that I see a lot of companies struggle with is that the strength public cloud has is also its weakness. You suddenly find organizations using public cloud as free money. People use it, but they don't really utilize it. People, uh, uh, if you're managing the cost center for infrastructure, it becomes hard, even impossible in some cases to know who's using what. Is it business important? If you have to optimize, what do you optimize? Who do you optimize? And we had to build that muscle internally ourselves also because we were still using public cloud. So we had to build the processes, we had to build the automation, we had to build teams that enabled 
product teams to be able to manage public cloud and get services from the public cloud the same way you would do if you're running on private cloud. And that turned out to be very beneficial for a couple of reasons. For product teams, for engineering teams that wanted to run services or that wanted to build product, uh, it removed this dichotomy of, oh, am I using public cloud or private cloud? The interfaces become the same. They, they operated the same way. The fact that some of the stuff wasn't public or private became a detail that they no longer cared about. On the business side of things, since we brought in the discipline, we started avoiding cases where you will discover there are 1,000 machines running something which were not doing anything, but the bill does show up at the end of the month, and you have to pay for it. Because we're able to control when people ask for machines, they would ask the same way they would ask for public cloud. And something that if any one of you are running in front of any scale in public cloud, I would strongly encourage you to think about. Just to quickly um, do a bit of recap, um, the three questions that we use, uh, as I mentioned, Dropbox has adopted a hybrid infrastructure uh, strategy, which may or may not be the right strategy for you, but I think the three questions that really worked for us to figure out the right answer is, do you have the scale? Do you have the ability to innovate? And do you have um, the business impact that you can justify because of that innovation? And the lessons uh, that I would give to all of you that we learned during our journey in the last 10 years as we were building our infrastructure were extremely important to communicate what your strategy is. If you believe that the right strategy for your company is all public, take the time to explain it to everyone. Don't assume that people will understand that's what it should be. If it is private, same thing. If it is hybrid, same thing. Just take the time. It's very important for everyone to understand why we are doing things the way we are doing. Also, automation, no matter whether you're using public or private, I think all of us know, we, as you scale your organization, as you scale infrastructure, scaling it with humans doesn't work. So investing in automation to tooling systems that auto repair, that take care of the operational complexity is very important. And last, not the least, is making sure that you take the same approach that the industry has built over the last, I would say, 20, 30 years in the private cloud and bring it also to the public cloud. That discipline and being able to manage your public cloud the same way you do in private does give long-term benefits in how you manage and scale up. And that's all I had for this talk. Thank you so much. Questions for Akil before we head on out? Thanks for the talk. Um, so your network ingress and egress needs are obviously pretty huge. Yeah. Um, how much did those costs and other factors come into play in your decisions for public versus private? Is there anything in particular that you did to like did differently because of those? So in, in network, I think our driving motivation was performance. Uh, so if you use Dropbox, and when we talk to anyone who uses Dropbox, uh, uh, the product that we have is being able to access your content of the data. And one of the biggest things that people value when they want that is they want speed. So for us, the driver was actually the performance. Uh, cost, I think, becomes a means to an end when we are innovating and delivering performance. You start finding ways to do it at the, the cheapest way to do it. Uh, but our investment on network was definitely more driven by we want it to be blazingly fast. We want it to be the reason that you use Dropbox, not anything else out there. And that has huge business impact. People, if uh, our consistent user research shows that people prefer our solution to anything else in the competition is because of performance. And, and just to follow up, so you, could, could you offer similar services on public cloud if the performance was there? I mean, is that, is that uh, where the show stops? Yes. And no, I think it, uh, at least this is my opinion, in, in public cloud, you're still in the same backbone as all other tenants of the public cloud. So you deal with all the stuff. It's almost like an internet of its own. So if you're done networking in this audience, you know how bursty and how uh, oversubscribed network is. So our experience has been network does tend to be a little bit more, uh, more performant if you manage the backbone as opposed to using a leased line or something. I mean, so that's, that's something that, it has been our experience, but it's getting better. But whenever we keep testing it, but I think network definitely remains one of the things that if you really care about it, you have to build your own. I think Netflix also has its own CDN for a reason. Thanks. I am curious about the broader applicability of this, because obviously 
given the, the three questions, if you do ch decide that you have a unique value to bring with your own internal engineering team, I mean, is this reasonable? Are your three questions reasonable for others to consider given that type of engineering challenge that would be required to bring that kind of unique value to your own private cloud? I think it's reasonable, uh, and when I talk to companies, I just keep emphasizing the talent. You have to have a very specific kind of talent to build that kind of infrastructure. Uh, so when we build our own in-house exabyte storage, this is one of the probably of our four exabyte storage systems in the world. You require talent which is both expensive to get, but then you also have the ability to be able to get that talent to your company. Uh, but if you can do that, then yes, the benefits could be meaningful. And that's the question leadership and all of you have to decide for your company. Uh, for us, it made sense, but the companies where I said, look, you may not be able to get that talent, so. So I'm sure you're hiring. Just, we just, say, we just, are just hiring. give up and join Dropbox, yeah. right? <laughs> just give up and join Dropbox, that's good. Don't do that, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I was wondering, um, amongst those three questions on whether or not to go public or private on the cloud, is there also like the regulatory landscape and policies that come into play with 70% of your users overseas? Um, does it depend on you know, which country you're operating in hmm. that the public and private combination would come into play? In those three questions, we actually put that in the business impact. So the, think of this as, uh, obviously the landscape is changing. I'm sure all of you like more and more countries are looking for different regulations, uh, governing data and things like that. For us, it all factors into the business impact. If we see that our users are dis wanting certain capabilities, whether it's data residency, uh, and if we can innovate faster, to deliver that value faster. So in this case, for example, the reason our storage is hybrid is because public cloud does give us to land some things in a country faster than building our data center. That's the reality, that's physics. Like if anyone has built data centers, you want to put something in Singapore, there's something out there that you can already use on day one. You may not have that if you're building a data center. So for us, the business impact, so it does factor in, but that factors into whether there's a business need. Uh, if our customers don't care about regulations, maybe that doesn't matter. I mean, it depends on the business you guys are in. For us, definitely is one of the factors that we do take into account. Uh, APJ is one of the reasons we announced APJ recently is because to, there were customers asking for that because they wanted to be able to uh, put the data in their local country. And that if they want it, it's our job to give it to them. <laughs> 